we are we are done oh awesome <laughs> great <laughs> so it's working now okay perfect so Yeah, hello everyone. This is Yemo from Yemo and the Minority Globe. This is Blackout Talk with Creatives. Each time we meet an artist to talk about art and creativity. I'm honored today to talk to Emeka Okereke, the founder and the talented artist, photographer, the founder of um, Invisible Borders. So let's hear more from him. Emeka, I would like to begin the conversation by trying to know you much better. I would like to ask you if you, what kind of piece of work, it could be art piece, it could be a movie, it could be a book, a dance that influenced your life, that had an impact on your life which helped you to take this journey? Um, first of all, thank you, Yemo, for inviting me and for sort of like making this uh, conversation happen. No of way. course, yeah. And of course, this uh, is almost like a follow-up of my meeting you for the first time not too long ago. Yeah. Um, so first off, uh, like you've already said, I am the founder and artistic director of Invisible Arts Trans African Project. But before that, I am a visual artist, okay. um, a photographer, writer, filmmaker, and okay. recently I am hosting podcasts, DJing, coordinating, okay. teaching. So there's so many things, and so. <laughs> and of course, I think it is more. A function of our time yeah. uh, in the 21st century that going forward you see a more and more a lot of uh, multi-disciplinary artists yeah. so it is yeah. it is a function of our time um, yeah. people are becoming more multi-purpose as we look for ways to solve the problems of our society Perfect. we tend to take on or wear many hats as a way of looking for yeah. ways of breaking or hacking if you yeah. may the system yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah so i think that's really in a nutshell but you know as we go forward um i will talk more about what i do and what yeah. informs what i do um you've asked me to present something you know an artwork uh, or something that i feel that we can use as a departure point yeah. Well, I've been doing I've been doing this for 17 years, so there's a lot, <laughs> you know. But <laughs> to start off, I will start with uh, this book uh, by Franz Fanon. Oh, <laughs> um, Wretched of the Earth, and as a departure point, this is mind blowing, you know, <laughs> because yeah. I also I also have. Front Fanon, yes. Please, can can you get me my book somewhere? Yeah, yeah. You can, you can, you can go on. So yeah, um, to start off with this, the one I would have really have loved to start with, but which I don't have the copy here. Ah, great, great. So you have it in French, and I and I have it in English. Yeah. Um, although I speak French, my French is not as. Uh, you know, together as your own. So I have stayed with the, with the English side uh, as opposed to pushing my friends to the point of reading, reading big text. Yeah. Um, uh, on, uh, so yeah, um, I would have loved to start with uh, even Steve Biko's um, I Write What I Like because that okay. was really the book that got me moving intensely. Okay. I remember reading this book uh, in, in the plane, flying from Johannesburg back to Paris. Yeah. Uh, I, I got it in Johannesburg when I was in, when I visited Johannesburg in 2008. Yeah. And I read all of the book. 
from beginning to end in the in the play. Which is I I I write I I write what I write what I like. Frank talk. I, you know, so write, he he yes, I, he wrote all this series of essays and he had the pen name Frank Talk. So he was signing off with Frank Talk. Frank talk. And it was so powerful, so potent. You read the essays, you understand why Steve Biko was a was a force to reckon with and mm. was very dangerous. Um, as we'll get to know eventually, there is nothing in his personality that is violent. Yeah. But his mind was very powerful. And that was, you know, for me, the beginning. One of the beginnings. Started thinking. I remember telling myself in the plane that, you know, all this whole conversation about being black. You know, for the first time I said to myself, you know, if you look around what is happening around in the world today, yeah. I think somehow there is something very powerful and very potent about being born black. Yeah. If you recognize it. Yeah. And that was really where it began for me, where I started thinking about the power that I, um, that I was already born into. Yeah where you begin to think of the whole idea of reincarnation in a different way. Yeah, perfect. That your life preceded you already. And I think it was the time that I started really being more conscious of the things that I do and the fact that there is nothing that you do that is detached from history. That's true. And that we... we we often engage in our reality, but what we are doing is that we are taking part in reimagining and, you know, uh, rearticulating history. Perfect. And, and, that, and that was it really. That was how it really began for me. Yeah. yeah. I, I, just, I, I just like when you are talking about reincarnation because just so recently, I'm being, I've been asked this question, oh, you are creating and this and that. I'm just realizing because it's a word, this, most of these spiritualists, I'm not talking about this uh, ritualist, I'm not talking about real spiritualists. Mm -hmm. They use this word a lot. Mm -hmm. they, they use this word about experiencing life. Mm -hmm. And it's just of recently I start understanding what it means by experiencing life. Mm -hmm. Because it happens that most of the things I'm into, I'm creating, all the mediums I'm using, it happens that it has been my background in Ghana. Mm -hmm. I knew about, I knew about much of them, but I didn't know that they were filmmakers. I didn't know that they were this and that, they were that photographers who migrated to the state. I only know about my uncle was a footballer. I know about the musician. I know my, my father as an architect, but I didn't know that some of the art forms that I'll be practicing using I, I didn't know that i'm just mm -hmm. realizing that i'm just being informed i got involved with university issues and i'm just being informed that one of my uncle is a lecturer at, the, at harvard university i'm like well mm -hmm. so all everything i'm doing I, I did it i'm just experiencing life it could be up after after before before bef in a different world so it's it's i love this word where you say reincarnation we mm -hmm. experience, we don't really create, we mm -hmm. are experiencing things yeah, that we yeah. don't even know. Yeah. We are just you know, this is, this is also interesting. As I was thinking about this conversation we're going to have, I was also thinking about the first time I was listening to you um, talk about your journey and talk about um, how, you became, how you became who you are today. And I was really reflecting on that as that in and of itself, mm -hmm. an art piece in and of itself, that that deserves to be looked at and articulated. Yeah. That there is some, that is, there is the organization that you have, there is the work that you make, but there is also the journey, this whole notion of the journey, of course, which you, you know that we are big, big in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I have a, I want to really like ask you, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, to go into that, that, you know, your experience, your trajectory, your journeys, yeah? But uh, give me one minute. Let me plug my com computer because <laughs> I, I, I realized that. Perfect. I, I have that one minute for you. <laughs> All right. Just in case. Uh, 
All right. Yeah, so sure. yeah, all good. So I just I just wanted us to sort of like talk about, yeah. you know, how you have moved. Yeah, I, I, I will say because I have I had the opportunity to sit down about a couple of years ago with with an artist you have worked with, a writer who is very famous now because he he, he represents Nigeria at the Venice uh, Benin recently, which is Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. Emmanuel, mm -hmm. I saw you, you have worked with him a lot. Mm -hmm. Emmanuel, I was narrating my, because he wanted to know a couple of years ago and I will brief you, but yeah, I'm, I'm, a, a, I'm, how do I, I'm a fragment of life. Mm -hmm. wow. This is how I will put it. I'm a fragment of life and I keep discovering things and I keep saying, one, one, once upon a time I told a policeman, if you know who I am, if you know where I'm coming from, mm -hmm. you wouldn't believe. But in, mm -hmm. because in your culture, anybody who, are, who, be, who will go through what I've been through just in a second mm -hmm. will cause a lot, of, a lot of trouble to justify it. Exactly. I'm, I, I am not. Mm -hmm. So I've been through a lot of things. And when I think things were getting to settle down, everything broken. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fragment. I'm a pieces of something which it cannot be, it can't be explained. I have mm -hmm. to leave, I have to leave uh, Ghana at a very young age mm -hmm. to, to, to move away because of issues, not from government or something, but from, from family. Mm -hmm. And this uh, a long, it's a long book coming out. And then you keep going and you have to grow up. I grow up outside Ghana on my own. Mm -hmm. I did it everything on my own. Mm -hmm. I left Ghana with the only contact of my uncle, mm -hmm. who is an American, that when I'm in trouble, I'm going to call him. He's going to send me money. He's going to do this and that and that. Nobody knew where I was. He was the mm -hmm. only person who knew where I was. I was in Senegal. He mm -hmm. was the only one who got hold of me, let me say. A year later, he was mm -hmm. informed. Then he called back to say, oh, he's here. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? He said, go home. Go home. Every time we come in, he said, go home. I'm not sending you a dollar. Go home. So I have to, from there, I have to start doing my own things, learning my own things. But I was so lucky I met good people. I met mm -hmm. journalists. There was a journalist I, I live with who just passed away recently, Baba Kature. He was a, a mm -hmm. father. He was like a father to me in Senegal. Mm -hmm. I mean, who, who changed the face of media in Senegal with Sud mm -hmm. FM and other things. So with, in this house, I could learn a lot of things. You have a bunch of books that you couldn't finish reading. Mm -hmm. From world leaders, from whatever what. I have this book of, I was talking about this book of Lewinsky and Bill Clinton. We mm -hmm. have it fresh. When this issue started, the first book which came out, I had a copy in the house. So I mm -hmm. could read a lot of things to read the mentals of people. Then you are meeting public figures and everything. This is what really changed, modified my life. Not mm -hmm. even in school. Because I had a, I have a couple of months to get to the university when mm -hmm. this, what I'm telling you happened. And so everything I have to start the learning. And then when I, so I was learning, I mean, learning, reading books, meeting journalists, public figures, politicians, ambassadors, meeting people. These are the people who modify my, my way of thinking, who modify my life. The time I spent in Senegal, seven good years, I spent six good years with intellectuals. Mm -hmm. This totally modified my life. These are people who were very rich, who were going to the state and coming within a week. So with mm -hmm. that, no more encouraging you want to migrate. Where you would mm -hmm. think of going, they were going and coming. Mm -hmm. you know, you do, they're going every, every three weeks, they were somewhere else. Every three weeks, they can run around the world and come back. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, okay, th this thing of migration is a scam. You need mm -hmm. to... You need to sit in Africa and make money and then you travel around the world. So I have to start learning everything from these people. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, I wanted to see something different. Mm -hmm. Like we're talking about reincarnation. If we have to go to reincarnation from my childhood, I was fascinated about the desert. I was mm -hmm. fascinated about what is Fulani. These Fulani people, because they are bunch in Ghana. If you go to the Northern mm -hmm. Ghana, they're mm -hmm. in Ghana begging and they look different. Tall with tall earrings and now who are these people? And they said, these are Fulani. I'm like, 
where are they coming from? So my uncle will be telling me, my grandma will be telling me, they live on the desert, they are nomads and all that thing. So I got fascinated about them. Mm -hmm. And so these are all the things I wanted to visit the desert because of what I was, I grew up on the streets of Accra. Mm -hmm. And could, you'll be surprised recently when I went to Accra, I saw them again, the children, they were playing. And I said, these guys are not Ghanaians. They are totally different. It's, it was still the Fulani who were speaking total Ghanaian language. I give a piece of coin to the, them to share and the Ghanaian street children were fighting with them. I'm, I took the money from them. I say, you give the, all the money to the Fulani. They are not from Ghana. They don't have parents here. So I prefer giving them the money. So this is how I stopped the fight. I took the money from the Ghanaians and gave mm -hmm. it to them. He said, what about us? I say, your parents are in Ghana. Mm -hmm. They will feed you. I know mm -hmm. their situation because I travel a lot. But mm -hmm. these are the people mm -hmm. who inspire me to be interested on the desert. And then mm -hmm. which I will go again and meet a lot of artists, musicians, Tuaregs, I learned a lot of things, a lot of way of doing things that I wanted to know who I am. So I started searching. I'm the girl from Ghana. I realized the girl I'm coming from Sudan, Bedouin, mm -hmm. then traveled to Ethiopia, Egypt, and all this. It was confusing. Then when I, we start, I started learning about reincarnation, I said, maybe I must be an Arab. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But because how can I be fascinated about the Maghreb, about mm -hmm. anything with the desert? How come? It, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. So then I have to understand that I set life just the way it is that maybe the person I come, I will be heating. It might be then I read a lot of books like Many Lives, Many Masters. It says we have been born all over the world. Mm -hmm. So when you, you, you want to be in a particular place because you have already been there in your last, your previous life, or you have already made plans to go there. Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. when some people have this uh, psyche problem, then they start speaking in a different language they have never learned. Mm -hmm. Actually, they were being born in the previous life mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. those countries. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So these are the things, I mean, I started discovering. Then I'm like, okay, these are the things at least the schools have to be teaching us. Mm -hmm. These are the things the re religious leaders have to be teaching us. But now I'm making this discovery. So these mm -hmm. are all the things which make me, if I haven't, make, I haven't discovered this, I shouldn't be alive through what mm -hmm. I've gone mm -hmm. through, which keeps going. It keeps going mm -hmm. because I, I still never get an answer to mm -hmm. what I want. The person, mm -hmm. the last person who can give me an answer and explanation is no more. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I'm a fragment of, of so many things. That's I find, many I find that very interesting that you talk about being a, a fragment of, uh, yeah. of life. Yeah. Um, I find that very, very interesting. Uh, uh, seeing yourself, that is a, a whole being, as a, as a fragment, that's very interesting. And as you were speaking, I was just thinking to myself, you know, uh, between Senegal and Morocco, where you, you have built, you know, your life and your reality in the past years now, um, you sort of like sit at that you know, point where there's a lot of movement within the continent because it is, it is, um, it is uh, a function of that, you know, uh, crossing from Africa into Europe, yeah. you know, um, that uh, fraught relationship between the two continents. Yeah. So you sit at that point, you know, so there, there must be a lot of traffic back and forth that you have seen. Yeah. But, you know, it'd be interesting to talk about this traffic, but not in the sense of, you know, just the road, but more like about stories. You know, can you give us, or can you talk about, you know, some of the stories and, you know, some of the experiences you've had uh, really being in this place for all these years? Uh, because for you know why I say this is because we have the Invisible Dust Trans African project that is very much uh, uh, about movement, about understanding how the continent is connected. You know, we say Trans African, so but we took that from the Trans African Highway. You know, um, so we are saying that we take that as a metaphor and say we are, you know, making you know, sort of like a trans-African highway of the mind. Yeah. Um, but that is a strong metaphor for us. A strong metaphor because um, we know how the trans-African highway came to be. It's a colonial project yeah. that was abandoned 
um, it was the way it, the, all the highways cut through the continent um, was never in the interest of, it wasn't there to divide, sorry, it wasn't there to unite. To, to the, unite, it was there it to was divide. It was to cut up the continent, you know, in accordance to the interest of the imperial and colonial uh, 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 you know, countries. Um, but now that we have inherited you know, those highways, what are we going to do of it? This is really sitting at the core of our project. Now that we have inherited this after independence, now that uh, Kwame Nkrumah has talked about um, you know, neocolonialism as the last stage of yeah. imperialism, we know that we sit in neocolonialism. Look at what is happening in Nigeria. It is a function of the neocolonialism. Now, what are we going to do? Now that we know that we are Africans and we have inherited you know, all of this ability to tell our own stories, to be our own story, what are we going to do with it? So that's why I'm asking you know, this question to you. Is like, can you give me a sense of some of the stories and how, they, how you experience them about people who are trying to cross got stuck, eventually crossed, some of them died, you know, and things like that, yeah. Look, in fact, like I said earlier on, in, uh, in, uh, I was in Senegal. In Senegal, I have a very wonderful life. And so when you have a wonderful life, you would like to help the community. And the nearest community to me, because I was, then I, was, I have moved from the Medina of Dakar that which is you have Sobe Jom, Sume Jom, then you have a Stad Ibama Job, you have the Stadium Ibama Job, and I was living around those areas where I can meet the two communities, which is Ghanaians and Nigerians. But then I have to now move to where only rich people were living. And so the only, 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 only uh, distant intersection between the two was in Go. It's one, it was an island. Mm -hmm. So there I could go and meet my Nigerian friends. At Ingo, that's when going to Nigerian party was a big thing. We don't want mm -hmm. to miss it. We <laughs> always want every Friday, Saturday, sending messages. Yeah, there's a party here. We want to go. Mm -hmm. So I was then more and more getting involved with Nigerian community than Ghanaian community. Mm -hmm. They knew me better. If I will form my first band in Dakar, which is called the Royal Two with a Nigerian who also lives in Germany now. Mm -hmm. You know, we formed the band and record an album. Then everybody was talking about us in the communities. So I was so much involved. Through that, people were coming. Are you coming from Nigeria? No, I'm not coming from Nigeria. I'm, I'm being deported from North Africa. And you are a musician. You are doing boxing. And are, these are the guys. You have to go and see what is going on there. So they keep talking about the desert. I got fascinated. They don't know that it's a child. It's a, it's a childhood weakness that I will have to see the desert. So mm -hmm. talking about it again, then I want to go again. Then I had this friend who, is, who was called Jalo. He was participating in this Paris Dakar rally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, was, um, um, he was doing motor, motor, motor uh, cross. He was on the motor bike. So I, I could remember he came on two, three occasion, coming back from Paris, read Dakar. He said, I met migrants on the desert, we give them water and uh, like, what, what is that? People are, he said, people are walking to Europe. I said, but that is not possible. So all these things, hearing all these stories, my head was on the desert now. Although I was living in Dakar, my head was on the desert. I was like this, I was like re re living the, re the reincarnation of invisible bodies. You know what I mean? I want to go and know what is happening there. So then the opportunity presented and then I went. Then I went and never came back. I found myself in Morocco. I'm sitting where I'm sitting today, where mm -hmm. I never returned back to Senegal. I saw so many horrible things. And I, I, everybody have their own way of viewpoint. And my, in my point of view, I was like, there are so many things I can do to help. How can mm -hmm. I tell these guys that <laughs> Europe is nonsense? There's no need of going. After living with people who were traveling to Europe, I see they were going to the market every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, after all the all what I put on me as clothes and everything were being brought from Paris, from America, from New York, from Canada, it was coming from all over. Every week I have a bunch of things coming from me. The aunties were asking me, What do you want? Everybody going coming, what do you want? Oh, I, I need I want you to bring me a glove for my boxing. The the one I have is then they will bring a bunch of 
this thing, Max from Everest. They'll bring me all, they'll be buying, you know, everything was coming that, you know, and I, I, could, I could also move. I could also move around. So, so this, this sort of thing of a thing that you have to be at the other side to make it, it's nonsense because these people I'm living with, they are living right here and they are billionaires. And mm -hmm. they are going to that place as if they were going to the market, or mm -hmm. they were going to the supermarket to do shopping and mm -hmm. come. So mm -hmm. how do I tell this brother it's nonsense? Going there is nonsense. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I wanted to convince. Mostly when I met talented guys among them, I met, I met a guy from Nigeria, Tayo, with an American accent because he went to an American school all his life in Nigeria there. He wanted to go to Europe with a demo. Listening to the demo, I'm like, man, what are you going to do in Europe with this? It's like this is what somebody, you, you went to the studio and recorded this and you found yourself on the desert where people are dying. Man, you have to go back. No, Nigeria is not good. I'm talking about, I'm, I'm talking about 16 years back now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 16, 17 years back. It was like, no. I'm like, if, look, if you don't like Nigeria, go to a neighboring country. Mm -hmm. You can go back to Senegal where I'm coming from because music there is, those days, musical, well, Senegal was the third in the world. After the USA, mm -hmm. it was France. After France, it was Senegal yeah. in hip hop. I'm like, go mm -hmm. there or go to Guinea. I had some contacts in Guinea with, a, a, a musician who became big now, Takana Zion. Takana mm -hmm. Zion, we recorded in the same studio. So he was inviting me to come to Guinea and come and hang around to see what we can do. So I'm like, I have contact, go, but not, not Europe, please forget. So that was when I saw that, no, I, have to, I can do something. Mm -hmm. So this is one part of the Disney. After going on the desert, when I was blocked between, on the desert, on the middle of nowhere, I was blocked at the borders between uh, the first border of Mali and Algeria is called Boj. Mm -hmm. I was blocked at Boj and I saw real slavery, human beings slavery, human beings. And the young lady I wanted to rescue was a young Nigerian girl, pregnant. And she was in the middle of nowhere being captured as a slave. She was working and this guy was beating and everything. And they told me if I intervene, this guy will kill me here. And I'm like, what can I do? So I even wasted my travel. I stayed there for a week and I really saw that I can't do anything before I move away. Mm -hmm. So from there, I got now fascinated by going to places where migrants are being deported to. And these are the, the things I say, I'm a fragment. I saw mm -hmm. that I have been, I've been I'm, I don't know how I, I put this. I see myself as somebody who was dead and came back. You know, we were abandoned on the desert for three days, nearly three days, and we were dying when help came. You know what I mean? The desert patrol have to call for this thing to come and rescue. We were dying. You know what I mean? Everything was gone. The car went with our waters and everything. So, you know, then the more I survived, the more I'm like, I, I'm on a mission here. I didn't come here. So I have to abandon everything. I have to leave my boxing as a professional boxer. I was boxing in Senegal. I was preparing for... Um, African Championship, I was preparing for World Championship. Senegal, this team, national team was negotiating for me to take a, a Senegal passport to go and fight, defend Senegal, all this thing. I was young and so I was taking time to think. And now I have to, I'm like, I could have just died here. Mm -hmm. So upon going all this thing now, and everybody was following me when I was sharing my story now, trying to help migrants in the hands of those so-called so-called desert patrol, they are patrol on the desert, but I figured out they were terrorists. I was the first to figure out because entry from Mali, from Senegal to Mali, the bus was attacked and I heard the Malians were saying, these are terrorists, these are rebels fighting the government. So when I was in the middle of the desert, seeing the same faces and the guys were like, these are patrol on the desert, I knew who they were because they were coming for foreign currency. They were coming to rape the women, take money from us and other things. So all this thing, and every time I, I would take the risk, because I was something very so funny. I was the English guy from Ghana, Francophone, Anglophone country, speaking a perfect French after learning French in Senegal <laughs> with a professor at a university mm -hmm. after learning the French. So most of the time when I'm speaking, I'm the person that they want to address to because they mm -hmm. saw that. And then immediately they, they were like, are you a journalist? What are you doing in the desert? They put me aside every time. They're like, no, you are different. You can't have mm -hmm. this accent and be on the desert. You can't be intelligent like this and be on the desert. So immediately I draw attention from these groups or even from, from the desert patrol, from the police and all. Every time when I, they hear me speaking, they put me aside and say, are you, uh, who are you working for? 
they will always will interrogate me and consider the rest as normal, illegal migrants, mm -hmm. aliens mm -hmm. traveling. But I'm always put it aside, being interrogated because of the way I speak. They're mm -hmm. like, no, do you came here to spy on us. So mm -hmm. these are the trouble I got myself into. But more and more that people needed information from me because most of the time people want to, those who stop us want to talk to somebody intelligent and they will address to me, am I intelligent? I could be one of the most stupid guy among the group who could just speak well. And so, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because I wasn't smart about all this smuggling, what was going on, I wasn't smart about that. They were smart about that. I was smart in communication and observing things and say, this is not going right. But when, about when it comes to the human traffic, I knew nothing. And so the rest knew much about it, who is trafficking, who is not doing what. I knew nothing about this, but mm -hmm. I could communicate and observe and analyze things. It's because I was living with journalists in Senegal and one of the top notch journalists even in Africa, on the African continent, it could be. So I was more of, of observing. And so these are the things I saw that I couldn't save this woman. I have to look at her on the desert there where she's been exploited, pregnant, about seven months pregnant, and you have to be going. If not, you will die. You get shot by somebody, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. so going through all these things, I became very wild. Mm -hmm. So I got caught up, deported, finding myself in military camps, Algerian mm -hmm. military camps on the desert, being transferred from camp to camp, being transferred into police stations. The more I'm seeing things, the more I'm becoming wild. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Doing things to defend myself, doing shadow boxing, then making friends with, with the army because I get locked up and they want to, and then they want to know. So I was doing a lot of things to, I mean, and I said, boxing made people love me much mm -hmm. than my intellect. Because every time I have to do these things, we give hope to people. Be mm -hmm. doing shadow boxing on the desert, giving give a kind of motivational speak and everything. They're like, yes, this is the thing. So everybody, will, that's how I end the name. In Senegal, the gym, they call it, we call each boxer, call each boxer champion. But it was mm -hmm. on the desert, I ended the name, boxer. Everybody was calling me boxer. Everyone, mm -hmm. nobody called me a champion. If somebody <laughs> should call me a champion, you must know he's a boxer immediately. Mm -hmm. Everyone is called boxer, boxer. It became a name even in Morocco here. Yeah. People mm -hmm. trace me back. They came to Morocco and said, oh, this is boxer. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So yeah, this is how I end the name. And I was always taking risk. I was the risk taker. I'm like, if I have, we were lost and we were dying and we were saved. Then after that, you become wild on the desert. Mm -hmm. I saw spirit. I believe in reincarnation. I saw spirits when um, I'm like, I'm, I was out of my body when spirit came. I was like, what can I do with you? I mean, you're a tiny aunt, little aunt on the desert. You mm -hmm. just go, go away in peace and look at me and just vanish, disappear. Just like when you're watching this Alibaba movie and the, something, the spirit come out, comes out of the bottle. I was lying on the dune and the, the thing comes, rise up like this. And he goes, but a couple of years, I, I was discussing this. I wasn't the first person who have seen, seen this. A lot of people have seen. It's even in Egyptian myth, myth, mythology. I've mm -hmm. read books about it. I'm like, how do I saw this? And I was playing it well, took, took, taking me to be somebody out of the mind and finally a lot. But it happens that most of the guys I saw who went out of their mind, it was what they went through and they couldn't become normal again. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. these are the things and this is what formed my spirituality that came refusing to die. Refusing to die. Refusing to die, getting shot at, mm -hmm. and the, the, the gun wasn't working in Senegal. So I have this kind of, this, this story between life and death. I have gone all through all this thing. This one makes, makes me who I am today, fearless. Mm -hmm. If I'm dying today, I know it's my turn. So mm -hmm. all this thing, going through all this thing, I say, you go all this thing where God have spared you, the spirit, you, the universe have spared your life. You're on a mission on earth. Mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of mission. I don't want to, like I used to say, if it was in Ghana or somewhere, or somebody is making billions, right? And I say, I have get a call. The, the Lord has called me to come and do this and that. Hey, he'll be taking a bunch of billions from people. Mm -hmm. No. My mission, I don't, I don't, I can't pretend I know. I'm just moving. I'm a fragment. Mm -hmm. I'm, mm -hmm. an, I'm limitless. I want to live in the limitless. I'm not even, mm -hmm. I'm trying to be limitless that I don't limit myself. That's why it comes with different mediums creating so but he's a musician but then he's no more doing music man he's mm -hmm. doing something else mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you can you can no i can i can really relate with that you know when you yeah. you know come back to this notion of um especially as you talk about it in terms of and make all this connection with um with wealth 
or, or even the way I'm seeing it, scale, you know, mm-hmm. like you want to scale it up because again, that's how we often think of these things. Okay. So I have a mission, so it has to be big. Yeah. And, and it's interesting that you are also saying that it is not that. And this is also something that I myself, I have been um, spending a lot of uh, time reflecting on this whole notion of scale as attached to uh, our calling. You know, um, oftentimes uh, everyone wants to get to the mainstream where it is big, where, it, where you are the loudest, where you are most heard. But then I'm thinking, isn't that a misplaced priority? Isn't that more like you are not really getting the essence of, you know, this mission? Mm-hmm. That it is not so much about scale because scale, as we know, can change. You know, um, what is small can become big and what is big can become small. It is, um, it is, um, it is a, a, a scientific concept. It is a metaphysical concept. It is, it is a spiritual concept. Whatever you look at it, scale can change. Yeah. Um, but I think that what we cannot fool is profoundness. Yeah. You know, we can't fool profoundness. Um, so I, I, I find it, that's what I'm sort of like getting when you are saying that, you know, that you feel like you're on a mission and you talk about limit, being limitless. limitless. And if we think about that limitless now in terms of scale, everybody would be like, okay, then you should have actually been everywhere by now or big. But I don't think that that limit, the limitlessness you're talking about is, is in terms of scale, but it's, in, it's, it's, it's something else is this sort of like i think i would say it is understanding what you know is this fragmentation and what what it can do what it can it can animate yeah. you know it's very interesting to actually I, I i will i will push i will push i will push the conversation on your side to to know about you, what what do you think should be the role of creative in society? What do you think? So because I sincerely believe I don't have the answer to that. I can just have an idea. So I want to hear your take on that. Well, um, first of all, I think that creatives are. Uh, more and more these days, I go back to, you know, the concept of the artist, even in the Igbo culture. We have always had artists. Um, of course, we didn't have an art world or an intellectual milieu, but we have always had artists. They were all, they were, they were um, always part of the society. Uh, I was listening to a, an older artist one day in a conference, and uh, his name is Damas Moko. Uh, he is, you know, from Nigeria, and again, a very powerful and important artist, you know. Um, and he was saying something that then he was saying that you know the artist, the, the creative person, what we do is not abstract; it solves a cultural problem. Yeah. It critiques the culture uh, and the society. Yeah. It seeks to understand it. It seeks to articulate the psychology of a given society, a given people. It seeks to go where, where you know, people will not usually go. It, it seeks to take this whole notion of being crazy and being mad and being out of place and being an aberration and take it and just embody it, digest it, uh, make it in and of itself um, the the ingredient, uh, the ingredient or the raw material for um, the work. And I think for me, as I think that's the, the 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 biggest joy of becoming an artist because you know, for instance, when we make the Invisible Dads Road Trip, I remember that many times we will show up in a place where people cannot put us in a particular category. Um, because there they usually see the NGO people or they see people from the UN or they see this or they see that. And then they ask, but how did you guys show up here? 
what are you guys doing here? And then the surprise in their face will even make us more surprised. Like, yeah, what were we even doing here? But what is happening is that you realize that we are an aberration in that reality. And that what brought us there was simply our idea and our volition mm -hmm. to find a kind of impossible self, mm -hmm. to reach beyond and touch the impossible self. That one they tell you is not possible. Yeah. You know, and that's what brought us there. There's nothing, else. There's nothing else. But then you become this useful aberration. Useful because you are now making people to think. Yeah. Useful because you are animating the social power of your space and the people that you meet. Useful because you have brought yourself to the most unlikely place. Yeah. But what is happening is that because of that, you have combined energy with the place. And even people who are in those places are now beginning to do things they didn't know they could do. Yeah. And then we return to this whole idea of being together and doing together. And in, in the course of the Invisible Arts Project, this is something that have always kept me on the road where you go to places and you meet people. And the shock sometimes or the surprise or the way you have shifted the reality by just seeing you and it made something in them. And then they throw that back at you and then you respond to that. And then you realize that as an artist, what you have been creating is to conjure a space for that togetherness to happen. That's what you, that's actually the real work. Yeah. It is not the final outcome that you make. There is that, yeah. yes. But it's, first of all, it comes from, you know, that, uh, you know, conjuring a space yeah. for the performance and the practice of togetherness yeah. and doing together. And yeah. I think that for me to answer that question that you asked, what is the role of the artist or the yeah. creative person or the critic is, on one hand, to work with, what the everyday reality throws at us. And then secondly, is to look for ways to continue to conjure spaces for the, uh, for the preserving, for the preservation of the, of the collective. Hmm. And now the collective for me does not necessarily mean people coming together and dividing the labor equally, because we know that in reality, that is not true. That's not true. Um, <laughs> nobody divides you. People don't come together and say, okay, we are 10 now, so it's all 10, 10%. And then we'll come together, kumbaya. No, that's not how it works. And it's a disservice to, to, to humanity or to people coming together when you see things in terms of that very stark way. Because everybody comes with different personalities. I, I tend to, when people come together, I tend to think of more of harmony. Yeah. Because I have worked with people who their personality is just go, 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 go. They are like, they are stronger in doing. Other people are more calmer. So when you begin to identify how people fit in, everybody coming with their own personalities, and somehow it becomes how do you bring all of those energies and all of those frequencies together to create something of a collective. Now, when we talk about the collective again, it is something that transcends, that goes beyond the, sub the subjective. Yeah. In fact, the collective is a, is a sublimation of the subjective. It is a, re a reprocessing of the subjective. Yeah. So there is no, for me, there is no subjectivity for subjectivity's sake. It is at the service of the collective. That's true. Yeah. So when, when, when we create spaces like that for the preservation of collective, so for instance, I have shown you the book of Franz Fanon, and I always use Franz Fanon as, uh, as a reference because most of the work that he did during the time he was working, he had a short, you know, uh, career life. Yeah. Because he had leukemia and he was writing from his uh, sick bed. Yeah. But he never lost sight of the importance of the work he was doing. Yeah. You know, and at that point in time, he was alone because nobody could feel the pain with him. No yeah. matter how, you surround him with love and kisses. You will, never have, you will never feel the pain with him. He was alone. 
that kind of situation can discourage you from doing anything. That's true. So the only thing that could keep you going is your belief in the collective. Yeah. In the collective that it will go ahead of you and then become somebody else's reincarnation. That's true. You know, so, and that's how we are connected. And that's why I look back to our ancestors. That's why I look back to history. That's why I look back, not necessarily because we want to stay in, a, we, we want to go back to the past. Yeah. It was, it's never really the past. James Baldwin will tell you that history is present. And that's because we come back to this notion of the reincarnation again. Reincarnation in the sense that your life preceded you. Yeah. This is something that I realized as I started traveling and I started connecting. Why am I moving like this constantly from here to there? And the reason why I started asking that question is because I started seeing that there was events, you know, connecting as if they were all like aiding me in my journey. Yeah. People who come into your life, they aid you, they push you. It's like something is carrying you. And then slowly I started thinking back to even when I was born, yeah. where I was born, the reality I was born into, the family I was born into, the country I was born into, all of that is still part of today. Yeah. You see the line that I draw across all of those, they're not imaginary. They are real lines that has brought me here today. Now, if you can think about that, imagine taking that thought all the way to when you now enter your mother's womb. Yeah. And even before she, were, she conceived you, uh, 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 you know, you were conceived. And even before then, now you see you are now going more, 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 more. And there is nothing to say that your life didn't begin all the way before then. Yeah. So that is how I think about history. That is why I think about whatever it is that is happening now, it is important that we try to um, stretch the spectrum as, as, as much as possible so that we can understand where we stand in it. Okay. So that we can know if we're moving forward or if we're in a loop. Okay. okay. Yeah. So again, all of this is contained in that answer and in that question or the, the, the answer yeah, about... Okay. Okay what you know as as creatives should we be doing and but again it's about understanding the power that is already inherent in us understanding that because if you animate that power then you can stand by it if you can stand by it it will do more yeah if you don't believe in that power if you don't stand by it even when it's not working yeah it will not, it will always be like a failed transition. If you yeah. take off, it will fall. If you take off, it will fall. Th that's... And, and th yeah, this is what I have seen in the works of people who have preceded us. James Baldwin, Franz Fanon, Tony Morrison, Kwame Nkrumah, many of them, you know, the tenacity, the dedication was always, had always this, you know, side of it that we are not doing it just for ourselves, we are doing it as a way of preserving the collective, but also as a way of, you know, fostering regeneration. And that's for me another word, regeneration. Because that is one um, character, or should I say one uh, uh, character of, yeah. of nature is to regenerate yeah. itself. It's happening all the time. The cells in our body is regenerating, replenishing, yeah. you know, dying, healing back. So uh, imagine that we can think of our work. First, because our, our world is messed up, then we begin to think about our work as a healing process that is also happening in our body yeah. every day. Yeah. Our cells yeah. are trying to heal itself. That's one. But then to see also as regeneration, you know, preserving, for posterity, giving birth and leaving behind something for those who are going to come later. So again, that for me are the ways I'm just every day, that's how I wake up to think. Because I think that these are all components, important components of life. 
if you say Perfect. something has life, it must have these things. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So what I have, I have, I was listening to you after listening to you, I was doing my analysis and, and again, don't have me wrong like, because I don't want to be limit. I'm, I'm just, it's a possibility. My mm -hmm. possibility is that what I understood was that creation, it's already happening within. And that's why we, 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 we create things. That's why we act the way we act in society because it's, you were talking about the part, if I will use the word spiritual part of it, it's a spiritual part of it where you, you have to go within yourself. It's not down outside, but within. So that's where I come again with the word incarnation because you use this word and so I'm going to continue using the word. Incarnation where, or reappropriating or re-experiencing, like I said also earlier on, I'm just experiencing life nothing has been created by me it's already there and i'm just experiencing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just experiencing what whether doing whether through music through sports to what whatever way i'm experiencing life and so this is what i have I've really understood and this this the word I, I will use like oh it's been used already these are words you have been we, i'm personally been hearing that if there is a creation there is a creation there is a creator. And mm -hmm. I want to put it in these modern times that the artists are the modern time creators. They are going to leave something that you'll be like, okay, look at that. Look at what has been done. Have you seen how they were thinking? Okay, then that was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, then 20 years ago. Then 200 years back, somebody comes and says, oh, but they were prophets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we talk about mm -hmm. Prophet uh, Emeka. Prophet Emeka did this. Or oh, 2,000 mm -hmm. year time, you will not be more, no more be called an artist. You'll be called a prophet. Because mm -hmm. those who did it in the past, we call them Jesus, John the Baptist, or whosoever. I mean, these are our modern day artists. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way I see, the, the way I see creativity is that I think of, I think my most, uh, realistic definition of art today is the will to express. I no longer see something hanging on the wall and say, this is art in that sense. That's true. Um, it is first and foremost, the will to express. So for instance, I often say to myself, if you say you're an artist and you want to create, how do you get to that, to that feeling, to that sensation of that's, that made our foremost fathers and mothers mm -hmm. to, that pushed them to draw something on the cave wall? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was that that pushed them? Because the moment they drew something on the wall, that was where it began. Yeah. But it wasn't what they drew on the wall that was the, uh, that that was where that was a, that was where, that was the manifestation of it. But what was it that pushed them to draw on the wall? If you can get to that at every point in time you create as an artist, yeah. then you are already in the path. Yeah. Everything else you create is a given. Well, it's 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 there is we can. And again, for me, I also say, well, there is the mastering of the techniques mm -hmm. and all of that, which is part of that you cannot negate, especially with music, for instance. Yeah. Um, a musician, uh, as much as a photographer or anyone who uh, a sculptor, you have to master your instrument so that it can help you. So when you're bending it and translating, it will help you. But before we get there, it is, first of all, the will to create. And you see that you know, across everything you do in life. For instance, you asked me before we open, so what do I do to keep going every day? Um, I work out, I run, you know, running is my thing. I run like about three or four times a week. But running is not just um, for me, something that I do so that I can stay fit. Yeah. I've started to see running as part of helping my body to take care of me because my body is already doing that. 
every day there are white blood cells fighting to keep me alive. There's a constant, amazing miracle healing process happening inside me every single second. And I don't even have any hand in that. So when I run, it is to help in that process of healing. It is to help in, in it, so again, you realize that part of that I bring to my work as well. When I make work, it is to help in that process of healing. When I have a conversation with someone, it is to help in that process of healing. When I run, it is to, so again, so that's how all these things are connected for me, you know. So art becomes all these ways of being conscious. And then what comes out of it, in my case now, could be photography, film, writing, DJing, podcasting, having a conversation with you, teaching, you know, it, it could be anything. I don't even know where, you know, it's going to go to, you know. So, and uh, in this sort of like freer way of being, yeah, uh, I, 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 I enjoy, you know, when, when you meet someone and you feel like the pause is there, the pause to give life to things is there, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting, you know, hearing all these things. And I want to call back, recall back to your journey. You talk about when you go back to art history. I will proudly say, or how we say, naively say that art history helped me holding the hands, holding, getting my hands on a huge massive volume as art book, art history book, made me really understood religion. When you say the first cavers, what the, the cave drawers, when they, they were, they were what, what, what were they, when their first attempt, I think their first attempt was to, to create something that was bigger than them. Mm -hmm. When you leave, read how art history, I mean, I, I, I read in your biography that you have been to um, a call, uh, National de beaux de mm -hmm. Paris. Mm -hmm. What was your, your experience there? What got you there? And can we understand your, your process and, as an artist going to this school? And had, had, what, what have it changed in your life today? And that's, that's interesting because, uh, you know, when you were talking about uh, leaving uh, Ghana and going to Senegal eventually, and doing, it, it, was, it was more like that for me. Um, you know, oftentimes when we talk about Nigeria, we many people think it's Lagos, but Lagos continued to be the same thing that it has always been for Nigeria, which is like the coast mm -hmm. from which everything comes in, including colonialism. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, but before, beyond that, there is the, you know, the hinterland, <laughs> you know, people live inside Nigeria, <laughs> in the east, in the north, in the, you know. So I come from the east, inside, Nigeria, okay. you know, yeah, and <laughs> and we, my 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 ethnic group, the Igbos, um, we are part of the. I think, well, I, you know, there's all that Bantu migration and all that, that happened, you know, so oh, Cameroon and all that. Yeah. Um. So I, basically, I moved from the east of Nigeria to Lagos as part of my journey. I started photography in in. In Lagos, and it wasn't too long. I started experimenting. You know, everything has always been about the power to dream and to call into existence what is in your mind, and to have the courage to follow through with your thoughts. Um, it is a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people think that it's easy, but it's actually courageous to pursue your thoughts all the way to where it takes That's you. True. <laughs> That's true. And then follow that with action. And then stand by the action. And then dedicate all your time to that as opposed to other things. You know, so again, and that was for me how I was going as a young man. You know, I had a streak of stubbornness that followed me from coming out of my, you know, parents and living my life with my parents, it followed me that when I have something that I want to get done, 
then the, the thing is doing me, you know. So um, I started doing photography, playing around. I made this body of work, and then eventually it was accepted at the Bamako Festival of Photography in 2003. Okay. okay. And I was invited to the exhibition. Um, I went, that was my first time of leaving Nigeria. We flew from Lagos to Bamako. But that flying 2003 would be what I will now reconstruct in 2009 as Invisible as the very first Invisible as road trip from Lagos to Bamako, but by road. But we'll get to that. Uh, so during this exhibition in 2003, I came. It was the first time I saw my works hanging on the wall. It felt like it wasn't me who made them. Because even though I was thinking of it, yeah. I yeah. didn't know what I unleashed. Yeah. And this is so important because I was doing it in my small way. Yeah. There's a part of the Bible that I always subscribe to. It says, we plant, you plant, others water, but God, gives the increase. Yeah. And you see that part of the increase is not on you. There's no point bothering yourself whether it will increase or not. It's not you. Yeah. Your part is to plant. Yeah. Others will water if it is what not watering. But the increase, God, and what, what's God here? God is all those energies. Nature, sustaining something that already has life it will carry it on, on and carry it, mm. keep going. Yeah. And I never forget this. And that was for me how it felt. I did my own little thing. A curator, Simon and Jami, saw it. Wow, this is interesting. He invited me. He put it there. And before he knew it, I was in the festival going about. I was already happy I came. I was in the presence of or in the midst of about 103, 105 African photographers I have never seen them. and I happen to be the youngest in all of those people who came together. I was enjoying my time from France. Everybody came together from France, from England, from the US. It was the first time I was seeing that kind of, I was discovering Africa for the first time, basically. Yeah. And what is possible. And I was even discovering the diaspora. So I'm seeing Africans, but who are also French. I'm seeing Africans who are also, you know, from Martinique, you know, all that, you know. So it was a really interesting time in Bamako. And Bamako's always held that, you know, that awe for me, you know. I was in Bamako in 2019 again for the Bamako Festival, and it was all over coming back again. And then seven days later, they were giving the awards, and, and then they said, well, your work won an award. They will, I'm wow. like, what? I didn't even know what, what an award. I didn't even know that I would even enter. It was my first work ever. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't bring it there. There were big, bigger photographers who knew what they were doing, taking their work super serious. I was already happy that I came. Yeah. I was, it was enough for me. I was about going home like, to go and enjoy and say I've had the greatest time of my life. Yeah. I wasn't in the hall. I wasn't in the space, in the award space, because I didn't think it was for me. Yeah. I was eating on the streets of Bamako with other Nigerians who were also there. We were coming back to the hall with my toothpick, happy and laughing. And then everybody's like, where are you? Where have you been? You have been calling your name inside that hall. Wow. I'm like, who? That one? No, you. <laughs> I'm like, I looked yeah. around, what? And then that was it. Before you knew it, journalists, interviews, there, there. And to cap it all up, you know, the award comes to the residency six months in Paris. Paris? Yeah, where's Paris? Oh, there. Okay, what they speak there? French. Oh, wow. Okay, I have to go to Paris six months. Yeah, so that was it. I uh, came home, uh, told my family, well, uh, you know, it's always been a big thing to go to Europe. I had family members who want to queue, who go queue up on, at the embassies every day, doing many things, selling their property. The time, when the time came for me to go to Europe, I didn't even have to go to the embassy. 
I gave my passport to the director of the French Cultural Center in Lagos. And then I came three days later, I took my passport, there was a visa in it. And then in between that passport, there was a ticket. I said, okay, Air France, you're off. That was it. So my life began that way. And I never really looked back in that journey. I continued. I came to there, I came there, I started pushing to get into uh, the Fire House School of Paris. I said, oh, you don't speak French, but how are you going to do this? Well, let's see how we're going to do it. Yeah. But eventually it happened. And then I found myself at the Fire House School of Paris doing my master's, you know. And then, of course, in the process, I was learning French and everything. And it became this, you know, and it, it all happened through uh, photography. So in, in, the, in, 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 uh, in the school there, it was a really interesting. I already came with a strong consciousness because I'm, I'm coming from Nigeria where we had Fela Kuti, we were having democracy, you know. Yeah. Uh, 1999, we had democracy already. 2000, uh, so I, 2001, 2003, I was already a product of the, you know, 21st century, first decade yeah. of the 21st century. We were like pumped up, yeah. you know. So the school for us was not, we were not wasting time, you know, we were reading. I had a friend who was at the same time at a second school, yeah. uh, two hours away, Kudus Onikeku. You know, he's a, he's, a, he's a choreographer today. He's a big one. We were, we were all there. Asha, the musician, if you know her, Asha. Yeah, yeah. We were Asha. all together. All of us were all friends. You know, it was a time. We, we all come together. We carried all of that Lagos energy to Paris. Yeah. And we would be, we would be like, yeah, we must do things. We must. Uh, and that was how he said the, it. The, 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 the underground, underground uh, guitarist, what is his name again? Isaiah Jones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so Kezia Jones was also there, you know, and yeah. funny enough, I was listening to his music today, you know, and that was the atmosphere. We, we, we felt we were unique, you know, all these Nigerians who are now speaking French here, who are in the art school. It was unique. We were the first, uh, you know, to go. I mean, there was Otoba Kanga who came before us, and she's okay. also a big artist today. She also went to the Boza, but it was a unique time. But uh, we were also aware that this is the, the, the first decade of the 21st century and the future belongs, you know, is really ahead of us. And so 2008, we started thinking, how are we going to translate all of this energy and begin to look at the continent? And the really first project that did it was Kudus, who came up and just from nowhere, because we were good at, you know, just standing up, he's a, uh, a choreographer, but he just said, oh, I'm going to organize a project for us to travel across Africa and do, and dance. I'm going to put together a team of dancers, photographers and filmmakers. And I was one of those people. I was filming and photographing. So we traveled six, six, uh, six countries in all the corners of the continent. So Egypt, Nigeria, South Africa, Ma uh, Mozambique, uh, Kenya, and Cameroon. Six countries, actually. Touching on all the cities, and he would put together a dance piece. You know, we'll come in the public space, unannounced, set up and begin to dance. we we'll photograph the performance, and people immediately, you have an audience. And what we were experimenting with was, how do we bring our art to the everyday person in the continent without cutting away all this whole you know, elitist notion of art. Meanwhile, yeah. that was never how it was in our own culture. Art has always been a part of the everyday. Yeah. All the art pieces that were stolen and taken to Europe and everything, those were useful objects in the everyday. In the everyday. Right. They were now put in the vitrine. Yeah. In museums, but they were useful objects. They had purposes. Some of them were, you know, deities, some of them were effigies, but they were... They, you know, there's, there was no vitrine. There was no the whole concept of putting things in the glass. Never existed for us. People used, if you, you know, artists made chairs, you will sit down on the chair. That is true. Yeah. And we're thinking about our work. How do we make it useful? Not something that hangs on the, in, in a museum. Could you started with that? Yeah. But through that uh, 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 project, traveling, I discovered the power so as he was doing dance, I was thinking the same thing. Okay, what happens if we do this photography-wise? 
I came back in 2008 and did a, a project in Maputo called Bagamoyo, Photography and the Public Space, where I took that concept, spent two months photographing the same place, the same community, and then I, I showed the photographs for the first time ever that any artist is doing that in Mozambique. I had to come mm -hmm. all the way from Lagos, uh, from Nigeria to do that, to show photographs in public space. Show, show it to the same people who you photographed. And then they are seeing themselves, you are mirroring themselves to them, but through the eye of the artist now. They don't yeah. know what is happening in your camera. But when you started showing them themselves, from your point of view, remember that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a visitor. Yeah. So I am looking at them in a way they have never seen themselves. Yeah. And when I throw it back at the mirror, it got them thinking about themselves. You know, so I changed, you know, that, and mm. this now led to Invisible Borders as well. 2009, yeah. we were thinking the same thing now. Okay, let's go on the road. We must, first of all, discover the continent. We must, first of all, engage with people. We must bring ourselves in the most unlikely places, and he made that space, and then see what happens when people begin to see themselves through you and through your like you entering their lives and, and them entering your lives. So that is the long and short of Invisible Borders. And since 2009, we have made nine road trips. Hmm. 2014, we, at this point in time, let me quickly share a screen with of you. Of course, I would love to see. Yeah, so we have uh, made amazing amazing road trip so this image you're seeing now was made somewhere in ethiopia the one you're seeing there yeah you know, i recognize this, somebody in the photo yeah and this is this is in, in yaounde by one of the you know photographers uh novo isioro mm -hmm. and over the years we've had you know artists coming joining the project photographers writers filmmakers mm -hmm. um from different parts of uh the continent and the diaspora. We've had these scores of artists coming to join the project and writing. Yes. And of course, it's, there is really no big agenda. It's on the premise that if you experience something, you must definitely, and if it resonates with you, you will make something out of it. Sure. You know, we make something on the road trip, but the real work is what continues inside the being of the artist. Yeah. Many of them, you've mentioned the Manuel Duma, but so many of them right now continue to reprocess, to re-experience, re like you have said now. Okay. The experience of being on the road. Yeah. And because they continue know, to to work with it. Sorry. I know Emmanuel Duma now is a is a is a very big writer now who lives between New York and, and, and Nigeria. And mm -hmm. He's doing long, wonderful work. I've been following his work. I mean, I'm, I've been trying to, to get him, but it's, it seems like he's not on Facebook, so I'll just try to, I mean, in the near future, I still have his email to, to contact him through his email, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's it, you know, and it's really to, 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 to um, articulate the psychology of the African experience and African reality and to offer something about that the more we do this, the more we want to stay away from the most prevalent narratives. You know, people are always forcing us, talk about immigration, talk about uh, this. I'm like, but there are media people doing all of that. That's but we know that's not how the life is, this is where we come from. There are times where people just hang out and they're not saying anything. Yeah. But as a photographer, as a writer, you are seeing a lot happening by how they position themselves, by their body language, by their body language, you are picking up things. Or how, yeah. how do we articulate all those little instances? Mm. We have done that through the writings, through the photographs. You can find them on our blogs and our website. You know, all the writings there come from lived experiences on, on the road. There is nothing that has been written that the artist, the writer is not standing with his, with, with his or her feet on that place. You know, so that is, uh, for me, I think that is the beauty of this project that we are not, you know, writing from 
our desk. Yeah. We are more or less uh, roadside intellectuals <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> what, what, what I can really surely identify with, I know some time on the desert when I saw so many things in the middle of nowhere between the borders because they are still doing this deportation. It's very horrible deportation. Algeria has started re it's recently again. They deport migrant to to where we call uh, uh, Tizawatin or Sibris. And that mm -hmm. from Tamarase to that side is very long. It's about 700 and 750 or something kilometers. Mm -hmm. Talk less of where you, you are from Nigeria. And so they will deport you to, to Niger side, which is about 350 kilometers. So a lot will choose to go on that side. But if you are not lucky and take you on that, up other particular side where I saw graveyards, I saw a lot of things. The only one thing I said, I wasn't prepared. I wish I had a camera. I wanted to make a film. I wanted to. And the guys were like, yeah, go and come back again. I'm like, coming back here again? You mean what? Mm -hmm. I need to be sponsored. I need to, I don't need to come here back here again. I need to have come with 10 people. I mm -hmm. don't want to go mm -hmm. through this trauma again. But that yeah. was when I, was, I started talking about filming. Mm -hmm. I had nothing on me, no phone, nothing. I was like... It's, it's impossible that somebody comes here. I mean, I, it was the experience of all even normal migrants. It was the experience that, wow, had we know we we're coming to see something a bit into something like this, we were going to bring our cameras. We were going to invest on cameras because there mm -hmm. was so much story to tell. And by then, so the first time I heard about Invisible Borders from mm -hmm. Emmanuel, when I met him, when I was doing it, through a research project, I was talking about it. I'm like, wow, they should be the right people who should have been on the desert at this mm -hmm. moment with me, or maybe I should have known them so that I should have gone <laughs> on this particular area with the concept of invisible borders so that I could have contributed with what I have just went through because everybody who goes there, every migrant was like, wow, I should have had a camera. I should have come back next time with a camera to film, to make a film here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is it, you know, and again, I'm thinking about this, you know, when I was thinking the same thing when I started hearing your story, I was like, you know, some of the things that we have been discussing and thinking about, you have lived. In, in other words, some of the things that we have been reflecting on is something you have embodied, but um, how has it been written? about photographed yeah. about filmed about yeah. we don't know yet but you have embodied all of that through your own you know journey as well. so um there is a need for for all of that to come out somehow that's true I, and for me i don't think that uh, however we do it say this conversation we're having now is all part of it yeah. as long as it is recorded put somewhere as an archive yeah. and that someone will return to it yeah. and that uh, younger artists and curators and uh, thinkers coming after us will have yeah. that as a material to now begin to even right. probe further. Yeah. Now, that's it. It's important that we begin to ascribe value to all of these things. The values, like you said before, is like if I tell you what I have been through, you will spend your whole life trying to clamoring for it to be given the right value or, you know, the hall of fame and the, whatever, you know? Yeah. But again, you realize that part of what is plaguing us as Africans is that um, we have, first of all, misplaced priority. That's true. A lot is happening that is of value. People are, you know, every day, and that's the experience we, you know, something we've experienced on the road trip, is that you see people doing ingenious things, but in a very small way, in a small scale. You know, everywhere you go, people are repairing, repairing, recycling, using, and there's ingenuity everywhere. But who ascribes the value? Who puts legitimacy on these things? Yeah. Everyone is still waiting to see, to say, okay, it's coming from the West, you know, but yeah. we are not looking at what is happening on the ground. And if we now turn our gaze and begin to really ascribe value to these things through our writings, through our music, through our, then you will see that we are really now talking about real progress, you know.
I'm, I'm hung I'm hung on this photo for a while. Uh, it, it it speaks a lot, but I can't really understand. Could we, could we, yeah, I can't really understand. Could you really like to curate on that? So this is this is a photograph that was made by Ray Daniel Zokuga, one of the photographers on the road trip. He's no longer here with us on Earth. He's passed on now. Oh, um, sorry, yeah. So yes, yes, yes. Um, but uh, he was one of the most dedicated, ardent, you know, members of Invisible Borders. Um, and he completed about four road trips before. Okay. Yeah, he's so from Cameroon. No, he's from Nigeria. Is and what's okay, interesting the is... The photo was taken in Cameroon. Okay. The photo was taken in Cameroon, but he's from Nigeria. And okay. this photo was made because he, he was a driver of our van. And okay. this is something that's interesting because much of, how, much of the photographs we have made on the road trip is also informed by our position. And this is something that is very important in photography in general. You cannot talk about a photograph without talking about the position of the photographer, the point of view of the photographer. Where the photographer is standing at the point the photograph was made. Okay. All of that is what makes the photograph. Yeah. You know, a lot of people yeah. see the image, but they forget that that image is a function of where the photographer is standing. Yeah. And he, angle. yeah, was on the driver's seat. Okay. And he okay. was looking through the rear view mirror and he was seen. So he, okay. he immediately responded and there is always this thing at the core of an invisible arts project is this question of, is this thing of spontaneity? Okay. It is everywhere on our project. You have to be spontaneous. You have to react. You have to, you have to react to the energy as you see it, as it's happening because we're constantly on the road and moving. So spontaneity is at the core of the project. Many of the work that you see, even the writers who, uh, who tend to be more composed and they find the time to write, they are also in that space of, con uh, of, of, of spontaneity when they write. Some of them are writing from the van. Some of them are writing, holding their pads as they are standing beside the policeman who is trying to check our van. They are writing constantly, you know. Yeah. And there's something that has to be, you know, expanded on in another conversation. This how the project really operates. But what's yeah. interesting about this image is that he just photographed this image that gives us that now has become emblematic of the Invisible Arts Project, of this whole idea of looking at the history, looking back at the history of colonialism. Yeah. And let's not forget that much of the colonial work, the colonial project was a, was a, was a, a missionary project, a civilization project by the missionaries. Yes. So, and that's what's happening in this image now, right now. So, and it's so, it's, it's so telling that he is now looking at the image from, his, from a the rear view mirror or the side mirror, you know, and then he is looking at the past in that sense, while yeah. obviously we are moving forward. And, yeah. and, and, and so that's, that's really what this image holds for us. So this man is sort of like leading these people past, you know, it's and always been the same, the same, the same yeah. project, never left, never left. Yeah. Uh, it, it, the missionaries were the ones who brought the colonial project to Africa before it was now taken over by the government. It was a and missionary. In the, first of all. in the image, you see a missionary there. He said he looked like a priest. Exactly. That's the whole idea. Yeah. That's yeah, the whole perfect. idea. And so, okay, and so that's it, really. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So again, that's that's uh, that's it. You know. Uh, so our project has been that. Uh, in, in 2014, we, we traveled from Lagos in Nigeria to Sarajevo, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and. Okay you know, through, uh, you know, by road. And in, in 2020, our last road trip was not even in Africa. It was in Bangladesh. Okay. You know? So for okay. the first time, we collaborated with photographers from Bangladesh to make a road trip inside Bangladesh. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we are stopping at the borders between Bangladesh and India and creating works about those border crossings. So again... Mm -hmm. Our work today has become our ideas or the way we are looking at the concept or the idea of Africa is that Africa is a story of journeys and it's about movement, it's about moving and Africa has always permeated the world and will yeah. continue to do so. Mm -hmm. So uh, to speak 
of Africa is not negating speaking beyond Africa. Yeah. You know, sure. that is one and the same. You know, the people who are crossing from Africa into Europe and the people who are inside Africa and the people who are spread everywhere, it's all the same. We carry our Africa everywhere we go and we yeah. are articulating that Africanness everywhere we go. Yeah. You know. Uh-huh. So that's it. That's actually where we are now in the project. So if I, w- I, w- I may want to say most of the few topics I want to bring up, you have already brushed into it, but I want to, because you've using the word Africa, Europe, the world, I want to ask you, because right now I know you live between two continents, but where are you actually now? I am currently in Berlin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... Perfect. That's where I am now. Perfect. So being in Berlin, in the eye of the photographer, in the lens of the photographer, how do you see the world? How do you see the position of African artists in the world today? On the world, I, would like, I wouldn't like to use the word market, but this is what most artists would like to hear from mm-hmm. the continent where they don't have equal opportunities. What, what, where is the position of African creatives on the global map? Well, again, the, the truth be told, uh, uh, first of all, um, Africa, as you know, um, is a very, or Africa, or African artist, you know, is very, very potent and full of possibilities. Um, there's a lot <laughs> um, that is even untapped. Um, again, when it comes to the market, it is again scramble for Africa. That's it. The same scramble that happened in 1884, where Africa was divided into into colonies. The same thing is happening in the art world today, where you know the West wants to buy, 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 auction Africa, auction African artists, you know, all of that. Coming, coming, coming to take, to take, to take, you know, that's, that's really the truth. So we, we it's important. Great. Yeah. So it's important that anybody who's listening to me now, who's out there as an artist or who's an aspiring artist to understand one thing. There's a big difference between being, you know, uh, uh, sought after. That is to say that your work is being sought after and enjoying your work. There's a big difference between that and, you know, that you, are being, that, that, that you are being bought, you know. So you have to always be mindful of that, that, that people are coming to write you every day, say, hey, let me, please do this. I want to have you here. I want to do this with you. I want to do that. It's not a, entirely an indication of success. You have to sit down to ask yourself, what am I doing? Perfect. You know, what am I getting out of this? And what are these people, what do, why are they wanting this from me? You know, then the other aspect of it would be to look at yourself and ask yourself, what am I making? Am I making work that is articulating our time or am I just making a product for people to just buy and hang on their wall and then use you to preserve their wealth and, you know, all of that? You know. <laughs> using so, you to I like the I like the word because that's yeah. the reality. They yeah. use you to do their banking transactions and all yeah, this. And and their and their tax evasion. Yeah. You know, because you know. So you have to ask yourself because it's a very potent position we find ourselves today. But it is not potent if it's not animated. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we will come back to the same conversation. Perfect. You know. So on one hand, it's a very interesting, interesting time to be an African, and even more so an African artist. However, we have to be deliberate and conscious as we move that, you know, that not all that glitters is gold. is gold. And that you don't even need gold in the first place. What you need is to understand what your position <laughs> yeah. in, 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 in the world that what you are working for is not just about making work, that you are affecting your time. 
you are articulating your time, that you are a conversation that is way larger than you, and that when we come back to it, your work will connect the globe and even maybe beyond the globe, maybe yeah. beyond the earth. That's true. It is important that we always hold that spectrum in mind when we create. It is not to say, oh, well, that's a lot of burden to, to think of all the time when I create. No, it's not that difficult. It is to ask yourself, how profound do I want to be and how serious do I want to be with what I do? You know, and, and, and that's it. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's the way I see it. Uh, I'm here in Berlin and everything I've just said here is true. Uh, I get a lot of people wanting to do things with me, but it's all dependent on the fact that I have animated myself every yeah. single day. Yeah. Activated myself every single day. Yeah. And when those offers come to me, I never immediately jump at it. Because no, that's not how it works. It's the offers are coming from the fact that I have animated myself from yeah. here. So there is no way I can immediately jump at that offer. I will analyze it and say to myself, is it going to fit into where we hope to go to? And if it's not, I will say no to it. And the value of that no is what I do with it afterwards. Basically. That's it. That's the value of that no. The no when I say no to you, the value is not that I said no to you. I'm not going to stand and now begin to worry about what you think of my no. Now, the value of that no is the, what I now go and do with the opening that has come out of that saying no to you. <laughs> How I fill up the space that comes from saying no to you. No, yeah. That nobody has any control over except me. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's so wonderful to hear this where you, you, you it's like you can't, you can't buy me. And again, it's so interesting listening to you, knowing that there's a lot of critical thinking, even in your approach, not only about your creativity, but even approach of negotiating your art, whether you decide to sell it or not, who are you selling it to? This brings me back to when we do several projects. I've done a lot of trainings and workshops to know how to get to a project, know where, how to get money to do project and everything. But most of the time when people come to you, say, but in the beginning, I had people were like, but where did these people get money and finance NGOs and association and other things? We were asked, also asking 20 years back when we didn't understand, we thought it was a, it was a kind of, um, trying to clean money, you know what I mean, how they call blanchiment d'argent in, in, in French or something. Mm -hmm. Then you get knowing things. Then I start telling people now, now that you guys are looking for projects, who finance your project, there's mm -hmm. something very important to know, and you have just said it. Know why they want to finance your work. Mm -hmm. Why your work? Why, what are they expecting from you? Because if you don't know this, you got yourself into a trap. Mm -hmm. So this is what you have just said right now. You yeah. want to yeah. evaluate yeah. the situation. It's not like talk, talk. Yeah, I, I like this work. And, and it's the same thing. It, it's a, the same thing when you are receiving fundings for a project. Mm -hmm. Know the person who is giving you the money. It could be a big company, a low-key person, somebody who is playing low. But the first thing to know, don't see the money and see your project. Why is he giving me the money? Yeah. And if you have to take the money, also know your worth, because the truth is this, yeah. racism and all of that slavery was basically one thing, devaluation of labor. So you yeah. go and take people, you make them work, 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 work. The only way you, all that profits came to be was by not paying them. Yeah, that's true. That's, <laughs> that's true. the only way you made that kind of, <laughs> the only way you made that kind of money. That's that was true. what slavery was about. That is and true. And till today, in the negotiations with, you know, when Africans go into negotiations, people also want to pay them less. Yeah. I was supposed to come to Morocco. The government was inviting me for their whatever, Minister of Culture or something, I think Casablanca. Wrote me a nice email and everything. When I say, okay, how much are we paying? They say, ah, 
we don't have money. He said, but wait, you are paying our flight to come. You are putting us in a five-star hotel. You are giving us, you know, breakfast in the hotel. So now I say to you, pay me. You say you don't have money. So basically you want to bring me and show me off as being part of the project, but you don't want to pay me. But you have money budgeted to bring me to Morocco. You have a different agenda. If you don't pay me, I know that it is not all, it's not, it's not the full story. Yeah. So thank you, but no thanks. You know, so, you know, and that was it. And again, these are the kind of ways to look at it. It is simple. When you engage, yeah. think about what you need to be paid. As for it, we are really at that time where you can only change by asking. That is true. You know, you really at that time. And the thing again is that when people say no to an offer, they still spend a lot of time thinking about what they have lost about that no. The value of your no, whether it is 1 million, 10 billion, is what you do after when you leave that place. That Put true. all of that into the next work you're going to do. Even if yeah. it's that thing you're supposed to do for yourself that is, doesn't give you money, it is what that 1 billion you said no to. That's the value that of it. That, that is true. So we should... We should... We should, we should learn, mostly in Africa, we should learn to say no. You because said, we are good yeah. in saying no to ourselves, yeah. but yeah. we are not good in saying no to the Westerner. So, yeah, yeah, there is that Westerner. I don't think, I don't want to make it a Westerner thing, but we, know, we understand. I know, I know, yeah. I know, I know. It is, I know it is more about, it, it, I mean, we have Ch the, the, the Chinese, you know, trying to sort of like swallow our continent yeah. today. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the Chinese who are yeah, who who want to re recolonize, they want to create their this yeah. their silk road. Is it the silk? What 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 road is yeah, that? The, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the yeah. silk road. I think yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are trying to get it back again. Where in the ancient time when things were good, so they want to get it back again and everything. But this one here, you just said about coming to Morocco and this and that. I mean. If you should be a musician, then it should have been different. You know what I mean? Which is not the case. I'm a musician and I don't make a penny. Mm -hmm. You're a musician where you don't live in the country and they are bringing you. I remember the first time Son Kuti came to one of the biggest festivals. It should be the third in the world, or so second in the world. It's called Mawazin in Rabat mm -hmm. here where I am now. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't recall which year he came back. I remember when after performing and the journalist asks him if he's been invited to the next edition, will he come? And the question, the answer was, look, if the king of Morocco would like me to come back and will give me lots and lots, lots of money, I'm going to come back. Mm -hmm. So in the next edition, I saw him and I'm like, yes, this guy have got lots, <laughs> lots of money. So maybe you should have done your negotiation this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I understand, you know, that's, it, it, there is that, okay, so people say, okay, you have to, you would have come. I haven't, I haven't been to Morocco proper. The, one, the only time I was supposed to come, I couldn't get a visa. I was supposed to be yeah. in that residency with Imano, yeah. but I couldn't yeah. get a visa. And this time around, they had assured me they would take care of the visa, clearly. It was really from the government. Yeah. And so I was really looking forward to it, and it was a really hard decision for me to make. But I had to, I had to make it because I, I couldn't understand. I was like, could it be possible that if it was, if you were inviting a photographer from France, the person would tell you I have tax to pay. So can you pay me because I have to pay tax? Are you now saying that we Africans, we don't pay tax? Where yeah, we come from, you true. know? So stories like that. And, and all of this is to say, it is not about the West or, uh, you know, it's yeah. everywhere. It's, it's everywhere really everywhere sure. because, because, because it's all about, you know, standing for yeah. ourselves so that we can move forward yeah. decisively. One, one, one last thing I can, I can say again about Morocco. It's not like Ghana or Nigeria or South Africa or Ethiopia. Morocco don't 
yet have a culture of buying art or consuming art apart from this because most of the festivals around the country are being mm. put in free by stakeholders whereby you can go to a big festival you can see bb king for free mm. of nothing when you don't composer don't want to be near the the stage those who mm -hmm. really want to be like see the musician performing in front they are mm -hmm. those who pay tickets mm -hmm. most of the festival i'm not talking about indoor festival outdoor festival so the country have had this privilege to see big stars for free why is mm -hmm. it the reason why no there are so many reasons these people are not trained like us to buy art. I mean, if you are playing music, nobody comes, except you are playing a bar where somebody can grab a beer or something. People mm -hmm. don't come. The, the few will come because it's because they really know you. It's because they love your music. So they don't consume art here. And that's why most of the time the musician will perform abroad or waiting for festival. Festivals now give you the chances to go and perform abroad. That's how mm -hmm. so everybody is focused on the festival, but people, musicians don't make money in the country, except traditional musicians, just like in Kano State, that's is like in northern part of Nigeria, is the griot who make a lot of money, who go to the Saudi Arabia. This kind of people make money, they're doing traditional music, they are needed in marriages and all that. And I've seen my friend musician, great musicians, Mm -hmm. doing their wedding and they are bringing these people to come and perform and they give them a lot of money it's like if i can get this money as a musician myself <laughs> look at my myself as a musician is that because i'm not doing this type of traditional geo music where you you shower money and i'm going to pay a bunch of money this money i'm giving to them i'll make it in a year you know what i mean so this is this is the situation here so i'll never be surprised that the minister of culture will be like okay it's okay you come and show off a bit and people get no you know and you'll be like no i don't need this i'm already known you know <laughs> this will be the challenge because it's not a place where people are used to buying art i mean most of the things you do here you do it for free waiting for festivals to give you inter international yeah I, I also got that sense that it was more yeah. about it was more to them like oh come you know we're doing this yeah. for for Africa. Yeah. So it was also an opportunity for me to say, no, that's not how we're going to move forward. You know, yeah. and that's not how, no. I know somewhere <laughs> in Nigeria, you are going to be paid somewhere in Ghana because that's the, the culture of consuming art is already there, but it's, it's not, it's developing, but they have a long way to go. Just like we also have a long way to go to put infra infrastructure in places. There are theater here and everything. You have the other side where there's nothing, we are exploited everywhere. You have here where the infrastructure is there, but it's not even being used. They are closed up and with a watchman who is being paid every month to, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So you have this contrast. And so this, these are the things that when you talk to artists, I mean, sub saharan from Nigeria, from other parts who are already living here, they will tell you the same thing. There are opportunities to be discovered, but don't forget about money. There's no money to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that should be the distance. So most of the questions have been answered. We have all, we have consumed the time, but I want to find, go with one last more question. But me and you, we are still going to meet. Mm -hmm. We are going to have one-on-one -on -one talk, maybe not with the open public like this again, because we, we keep on talking about how we are going to do our possible collaborations and other things. Yes, so yes, yes. I yeah. see that our people, our people are trying to make it happen. Smart, yeah. you know, on, on, on both sides. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there is this. And so one last question, who, which will be like, in the context of this global pandemic, what do you consume? What do you eat to build your immune system? Because coronavirus is like, the focus is on the immune system. If you, you don't eat well, this and that, and the food I'm talking about, it could be spiritual. It could be mm -hmm. showing this book of Frank Fanon. It could mm -hmm. be a, mm -hmm. a spiritualist you like. A, somebody who, I mean, it could be a meditation, your form mm -hmm. of meditation, mm -hmm. fruit and vegetable. I don't know. It, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's very interesting. It's a very interesting question. Um, this period has really allowed for me to do what I call jumping into myself. Mm -hmm. you know, and think of it as jumping off a cliff yeah. and into, you know, something that you don't, into a space that you don't know, that you have always kept, you know, or said, okay. So there's a lot of that process of courageously jumping into yourself and confronting the many aspects of, of, um, of, of who I am and trying to understand that. 
and most importantly, working out uh, a vocabulary for my silence, the silence that I meet when I jump into myself. And so that's first of all, and it has been a very rewarding process um, of sort of like looking in and a lot of self-evaluation, understanding that this is not just a one-off thing, that is an everyday, you know. Yeah. Everything that I said basically, basically today has been coming from that place, the healing, the, you know, is all coming from there. Now that's on the, on the inward uh, level. And, but also I'm, I've benefited strongly from the presence of family here in Berlin because I'm here with my family as well. Um, so I have benefited a lot from them, their, their love, their support, you know, um, every day. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed in that sense. Um, so I, I can't discount, you know, the, you know, how much that is, has been helping. I mean, I spent the whole lockdown, you know, with them, you know, and man, we, we, we tried by just hanging out with each other and getting to know each other and figuring out things together, mm-hmm. laughing, joking, all on the same small space, you know? Um, so that's that. And then when it comes to what I do in terms of physically, bodily, food, uh, well, it didn't change much, you know, like I didn't, for me, food begins with what you take in, how you, what you take in spiritually. It informs the way, you know, um, what you now do eventually. The food you eventually get to touch, whether it's an apple or meat. Sometimes I see that it's, it has to do with how I feel inside a lot. Yeah. And I'm the kind of person who's become somewhat um, more and more relying on intuition as, as the only way to make a decision. You know, like, it's not like it's, it is supporting your decision. It's not like, okay, it's okay, helping it's more. No, right. when I don't feel this, when I don't feel the vibe, there's nothing going that's on. it, that's it. I, I might do all my intellectual thinking and all my reasoning and all my logic, but if I feel this is not working on a spiritual visceral I have level, I have yeah yeah I, I cut off so more and more i think it began even with in bangladesh when i did the road trip before the pandemic started so being in this in the in this sense of so like feeling the energy around me as a way of moving and navigating my space so that for me has also informs now what i touch sometimes i wake up in the morning all of a sudden i feel like i need to take a lot of water mm. but i know that is not coming from just the hunger of water it is coming from somewhere. It is trying to cleanse me somewhere. You know, uh, my body is saying, you need to cleanse. And it's, it's not just about feeling, uh, sometimes I don't even feel thirsty. I don't feel thirsty. It's not about being thirsty. It's about something else. So that's an example. Now I talked about also running and working out. Oh, it has been uh, the lifesaver and has taken on a different meaning for me. Uh, meaning of healing and all of that. So yeah, that's it basically. Yeah. Yeah, this conversation was very rich. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, w- I want to thank you a lot. And I don't want to be I was insensitive with the situation in, in Nigeria at the moment. And so maybe maybe one last word because I said Nigeria because the whole world is is focused on Nigeria now. African youth, as a Nigerian, you might know, or as a Ghanaian, I might observe everywhere I go, the African youth are, are passionate. I have mm-hmm. passion for Nigeria. Everything that comes from Nigeria. I was in Senegal. They were going, people were going to shops to buy. Until now, it became available everywhere. It was very expensive to watch Nigerian movies when I was in Senegal. We <laughs> have to always to go to shops. The Senegalese, everybody was rushing. Either it's a Nigerian guy selling it, or Senegalese selling it, we go and rent the CD and go and watch it and take it back and change it, exchange and other things. Now everybody, Nollywood has, it's a big thing now, the second in the world behind the Bollywood. 
And so a lot of things are going on. Now the music comes in again. It's a very big boom. And then we are rediscovering art and everything. So everybody is inspired by Nigeria. No matter what the narratives, people always will focus. When you hear Nigerian artists somewhere, people are focused. No matter what all the narratives, I wouldn't use the word negative. No matter how the narrative, people participate. Yes, yeah, like that. But when it comes to art, or we're talking about Shimamanda, then people are focused now. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So Nigeria is all kind of things that it's inspired African youth. Whatever happens in Nigeria will happen all over Africa. So now the youth are watching what is going on there. And I don't know if they're going to replicate in, in, in their own countries. They're going mm -hmm. to see the outcome. What is the advice you give to, will you give on this? How will you comment on, do you want to, what is your take on this? And mostly to creative photographers, are they taking the opportunity now? Are they going to document it so that in 50 years time, I mean, somebody will come in the archive and say like, yeah, wow, this happens here in Manduguri or it happens here in Lake, Lake East, something like that, you know, or Lagos. These are the things which happen. What mm -hmm. are you as a photographer? Are your guys on the ground taking the opportunity, taking a chance? Yeah. Um, first of all, yes. Um, the protest um, has been really sufficiently photographed and we see that every day uh, on social media and i must say that this is uh unprecedented you know what is happening this kind of protest the way it is happening um youths coming out and really going out there to protest and say enough is enough um nigerians normally don't like protesting because it always means like what happened eventually that somebody dies and Nigerian, a Nigerian would rather, you know, preserve his or her, or her life and go back to hustling every day than to go and die, you know, because the nature of the country is that every man on your own, you know, because we are still trying to figure out how we can become a country, 250 different ethnic groups, over 500 languages, everybody on your own, you know? And so, and then once in a while, or many of the times, we are vying whose Nigeria is better than the other person's Nigeria, you know? That's what is happening internally as Nigerians. But outside that, Nigerians are respected, like you said, and there is something, you know, to be said about that. There's something to be, you know, um, it is, Nigerians are very resourceful people. You know, the energy that we see today on the streets, you know, we've known it. We see it in the everyday person, the truck pusher, the bricklayer. The, every day you see this guy, the way, the tenacity, the grandma, the mama who is selling in front of our house in Lagos. Every day, 5 a.m., she's up. And how much is she making? How much is she making from what she's selling? And yet, she's selling plantain and eggs. Yet, 5 a.m., she's up. She sells consistently. So oh, I, I, what I, I, I stay on my balcony there, I'm watching. Everything people have said about what makes you successful, she does. She's consistent. She does her business. She's focused, everything. And yet, it's that small life that she has. And she keeps at it, you know. And many people, like you said, many people will not continue to do that work if it's give them small, that very small returns. We would have abandoned it that we're looking for bigger, bigger, bigger opportunities. So you see that energy. So where is it coming from? The everyday person have that tenacity. So all of that came out on the street now and pointed against, you know, the, the, the government, that neo-colonial government. But I want to believe that, I want to really believe that it is like I said before, Kwame Nkrumah said, it is the last stage of imperialism, that we are now leaving that behind that we are moving into something. He said it, that neocolonialism is a last stage of imperialism. And that's basically what all our, our leaders have been since a, a good part of independence is neocolonialism, you know? So I want to believe that all of this is pushing us towards a new way of being. However, it is important that we continue to expand, like I said, the spectrum and weigh this you know, 
in a, in, a, in a broader context so that we can know where we stand and so that we can know how to go forward. Because if it is about, you know, answers and the protests now, it is, it is, it is uh, easy to disrupt it. But if we begin to look for ways to, you know, expand it into other spheres of our lives, most importantly, our everyday lives, so that it becomes all these little fragmented revolutions happening, you can't catch it. You can't catch that guy. It's like air. It has to enter everywhere, infiltrate. But, but if it's in that small cluster of a protest like that, they can easily squash that. And they are trying to do that now. But I'm saying, I'm hoping that we are witnessing that change and that we can look back this period and say, man, I was alive when this happened. You know, it happened in our time. All the things we've been talking about, everything that Franz Fanon wrote, in you know the wretched of the earth and how the you know the colonized rise mm -hmm. and dismantle that very useless you know set of you know uh, uh, elites and rise maybe this is we are at it now it's no longer concepts ideologies utopia we are really making that happen and i'm really hoping that this is what is happening here to, uh, that, uh, that this period. Yeah, I don't know how much to thank you. It was a, it was, it's, it's like we have spent a year talking within a second, within a minute, <laughs> and we have traveled a lot because yes, yeah, we it have. Was, it was really inclusive and exchanging, and you know, you took me to Nigeria, and I, tr I have traveled too. I want <laughs> to thank you so much for your time, and thank you for all this you have shared with us. I would have asked you to share your contact, but I have everything, Invisible mm -hmm. Borders. You are on Instagram, you, you have a website, and we know where to find you on Facebook. So I'm going to share this again. We keep sharing it on our mm -hmm. platform. And for those who of you are following me, don't forget to like his work, to comment. If you want to know more about the Invisible Borders, they have their website. If you want to know more about my pro personal project to you can go on Yemo and the Minority Globe if you have questions, later questions. So thanks for your time and thanks for connecting with us. Emeka Okereke, thanks so much. And I'll be writing you soon because we are on a journey. Yes, yes. Thanks I just so want much. to say, yes. I just want to say thank you for having me. This has been very uh, amazing and enriching. And that the fact that we were able to do this in this free flowing way and really have a conversation as if we were just like hanging out. Uh, the beer and the drinks I'm, I'm missing though, but it's okay. Oh, this, I, sh I, I didn't ask you if, if I, should, I was supposed to invite you now because Corona, if you, we are doing a virtual this thing. If I was to invite you, what, what should, I, should I use? In, what, invite me what, to, what would be your drink? What would be the kind of drink you would like? What, what kind of bottle of drink you would like? You would like to sip a tea, Moroccan tea? Would you like to sip um, a, a good red one from France? I don't know which. What, what's, what's your... I think your it would be all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Thank you so thank much. You so much. And, and thank you to your team, because eh, I can hear them. Um, there, yeah. I think behind the scene, uh, big thank you so, to them yeah. as well. That reminds me. So behind the scene, we have Troisian, which is our partner. They're also diffusing it on their, on their Facebook page. It's, a, it's an art space. They're mm -hmm. also diffusing it. I, I have uh, Maud with me who is behind mm -hmm. technique, checking the technique, check, making mm -hmm. sure the sounds are going, checking if people are asking questions. So... Big thanks to all of you, Martin, Jawad, and those even in Canada there who are mm -hmm. sharing. So thanks so much. And yeah. yeah, and let me also say thank you to our own Elodie as well, who has helped immensely to, you know, make to to organize on our own end and do all the back and forth correspondence to make this happen. I don't know. Maybe she's also listening now. So if she's there, we just I just want to also say thank you to her for helping us out here. 
thank you, Elodie. Thank you, Invisible Borders. And thank you, Emmanuel Okereke, for answering my call. Emeka, 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 Emeka. Emeka, Emeka, Emeka. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm going to. I will mention it three times just to say sorry. Emeka, 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 Okereke. All right, man. So have a lovely uh, day huh? or evening. Yeah. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.